What we call the Paxton Incident is really two massacres. First at Conestoga Indian Town, a reservation set aside by William Penn with the founding of Pennsylvania. And then a second, the workhouse, where the remaining fleeing uh, Conestoga were taken in and then murdered in broad daylight. At libraries like the Library Company of Philadelphia, which have a long colonial history, we need to be doing more outreach. We need to be conveying the stakes of our work to a wider audience. And so one of the things that I sought out when I was looking for an author and an artist was folks that had done work that felt like it reconceived historical material with the urgencies of today. My tribe is the Tongva tribe of California. It's all a Los Angeles Basin, Pasadena area, um, Hollywood, basically the, the center of Southern California. With Shoyo's art, every page is different from the one before it. She is somebody who's constantly looking to challenge herself. I honestly had never heard of this event. It really kind of sparked my interest, like, wow, why didn't I learn about this in school? And wow, why don't I know about this? I said, if I'm chosen to work on this project, I hope that you would maybe consider Lee to write it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're so glad to have you here at the Indigenous Comic Con. Please enjoy your afternoon and have a wonderful time. Lee has effectively made Native American comics what they are today. He started the only Native American comic shop in the country. He founded Indigenous Comic Con. We brought together folks from all sorts of genres that came together to celebrate this forward-thinking Indigenous identity. The thing with the Paxton Massacre and the redrawing history, we're being allowed the freedom to write about that incident from an Indigenous voice and to give voices to the people that were involved in that and shed light on a very dark historical event. At the beginning of this project, we did a number of uh, field trips, research trips, with uh, Weshoyo and Lee to ensure that they had a sense not only of the people, but the place that they were going to be writing and exploring in this graphic novel. What we're talking about here is long before any of these buildings were here, long before these concrete sidewalks or these roads. The way I think the highlight for all of us was our trip to Lancaster. We had a chance to go to the historical site of Conestoga Indian Town. When we went to the ancient site, the original site, of the Susquehannock people. It's in a suburb, you know, it's surrounded by all these little built up houses. It's a historical area, so they can't build on it. So they kind of have it disguised as a park. If you actually know what's there, you're like, wow, no, this is a village site. You start thinking about the people that had lived there before and the ways that they lived off the land, and it allows you to sort of connect a little bit, I think, with the environment. And I always like to try and look around to, to, to get as much of a sense as I can of what it would have been like when there were no houses around there, and it would have been all forested with the river running in the background. I went out and I kind of offered some tobacco as like a thank you for letting us, you know, be in this space, and then also as a remembrance of those people. They saw how Weshoya was just captivated by this burial mound that had been sort of capped off, and there was this little tuft of trees on top. And there was something so lonely about those trees, and I know that she was responding to it at a really sort of visceral level. So I, I create kind of a theme between them taking those trees off of that hill in present time and those, you know, 20 people that were butchered. How many places did we drive past that are the sites of these kinds of stories? I suspect that many of those farmers have no idea what has happened in that very land. It could be anywhere in this country, and that really forces us to reevaluate our relationship with this land. After these atrocities, the Pennsylvania proprietors, the government, decided to basically take in all of the indigenous peoples that were anywhere nearby, which included uh, Lenape, Lenape and Moravian Indians, basically because they feared this snowballing. The Paxton boys vowed to inspect, which really meant to um, menace those indigenous peoples where they were, which was in Philadelphia. And they got as near to those people as Germantown, six miles north of Philadelphia, where they were met by a militia and a delegation led by Benjamin Franklin, who persuaded them uh, through eloquence and through force that they ought to disband and to publish their grievances. And so then the next year became a print debate.
I remember looking at, it was one of the political cartoons, and it's got a Quaker, and you know, they're handing weapons to the native folks. It's a depiction of Quakers being sort of seduced by these half-naked Native American women who are literally robbing them. A Native woman is stealing a, a man's watch out of his waistcoat. And she's got this low-cut dress and her bosoms are, you know, like right over the top of that. And it's supposed to be sort of like how nativeness conned the Quakers into, you know, being allies. Native women as the seductress, Native women as the exoticized. And I was particularly thrown by that. Nowadays, one in three Native women are assaulted in their lifetimes. Missing, murder, and Indigenous women are numbering in, in the 5,000 plus, and there's no popular media for Native women. And it goes all the way back to 1763, 1764. It sort of draws upon this uh, fear of Native sexuality, and of course, um, this idea of miscegenation, the, this fear that the races were mixing in their backyard. Pennsylvania as a colony was comprised of so many different ethnic groups that really didn't see eye to eye. And those included Germans, English, and Scots-Irish Presbyterians. And it wasn't really until the debate about this incident that you started to see a shared white identity emerge in opposition to this racial other. And so much of this debate is about borders and about the sense that there's an enemy in your midst. And you can't tell the good ones from the bad ones, so they all need to go. One thing that we are trying to definitely bring across, not only with the script, but referencing the, the pamphlets and the political cartoons, is how they were used as political propaganda. The natives as, as basically a prop in this warfare between two opposing sides, the frontierists and the colonialists, right, the Quakers. Everybody had their own agenda, and this quickly became a story not about the conduct of the Paxton men, but a story about um, governance in Pennsylvania. when we went to the American Philosophical Society. They brought out this wampum belt. Many of the Iroquois and Algonquin people used wampum belts as symbols of establishing treaties, as currency. They were used <laughs> as documents of identification. Amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah, this is gonna be the repetitive motif, right? And I have an idea about how it can play, too. Oh, nice. You want to grab your... We had really put off talking about this one scene, which is really difficult to write because it's one of gratuitous violence. It's the scene in Lancaster when uh, the remaining Susquehannock are murdered. The scene that I put together with that was essentially a scene of Native people that, that didn't scream, that didn't cry, but that faced that head on. I wanted to change that dynamic so that it wasn't Natives being victimized, but that they knew what was coming. They knew what was going to happen and they accepted that. And that everybody dies on their feet. And that's a huge thing for me. We didn't want to wallow in sensationalized violence. We chose to sort of use some visual metaphors that tie back to, into the tribe's material culture in a way to visualize it without it being just, you know, the sheer violence that actually did occur. Because the ways that those people, you know, were killed, it's horrendous. Individuals are transformed into wampum beads. This attack is the rending, the final tearing of this wampum belt, this symbol of colonial indigenous harmony. When people talk about the 1763 massacre, they often call it the Paxton Boys, March, Rebellion. These weren't boys, these were grown men, they were murderers. And to disconnect this story from the Paxton Boys and instead to foreground the indigenous people at the center of this story, I think is a real act of defiance. Most native people in this country, when they faced you know, the types of, of displacement, ethnocide, and genocide. They didn't have a, a newspaper where they could tell their own particular story. I think a lot of the, the issues people have with Native people are we have already been obliterated or we are extinct. There are all sorts of folks that identify as descendants of the Susquehannock, and you have an obligation to the living. Indigenous identity uh, continues to be something that's mythologized. When we dive into the humanity of individuals and people, we start to break out of the mythology of that. 
One of the key things that me and Lee have both worked on together in this project is focusing on positive representation that we are still here and huge emphasis on the resiliency that we have as a people to carry on through generations and despite so many bad things happening to us, we are still here and we're still trying to present ourselves in a positive way.